Joe Biden picks a Supreme Court nominee and it looks like it could backfire. The Heartbeat Act just hits the six month mark. Columbia passed some things we're gonna talk about. We have so much in the news to talk about. Let's get started. Welcome back to the Pro-Life Podcast. I am joined by my awesome cast, Kim, our pro-life activist, Veronica, our pro-life educator, and Emily, our pro-life lawyer. I'm Brent, the pro-life techie, nerd IT guy, guy, IT guy. Yeah, we'll go with that. So, my goodness, so much to talk about. The world caught on fire while we were away in the last week. But Joe Biden has picked a Supreme Court nominee... Kim, I think you have some thoughts on this. I do. I really think this is going to backfire. So we've got uh, Katanji Brown Jackson. She's been on the uh, D.C. appellate court for about a year. And like five minutes. Basically, yeah, exactly. That translates to five <laughs> minutes, basically, in, in court time here. Um, so she's been on the D.C. appellate court for about a year. And uh, we don't have a lot of a record from her, but from what we can tell, it looks like she's going to be a judicial activist. Like she's concerned no. about, I know. Biden would pick a judicial activist? I know, I know. So Shuck. When we talk about, uh, we, let's explain what, what we mean by doesn't have a lot of a record. So when justices yeah. are sitting on an appellate court level, you get to know what they think, or how they approach uh, constitutional questions, how they approach issues by what's called their written opinion. So the decisions that they either join, but more significantly, uh, the the opinions, the decisions that they write. Absolutely. So she uh, doesn't have much of a record here. And a couple of times that she did author opinions, she was actually reprimanded by a higher court for stepping outside of her bounds and, you know, like judicial overreach. So it seems like she's an activist judge type where she's focused on what she wants the Constitution to say and not what it actually says. Um, now, we've seen this. That's how we got to Roe v. Wade in the first place. Um, but on the question of how is this actually going to backfire, uh, you've got nine justices on the Supreme Court. Six of them were nominated by Republicans. That means three of them were nominated by Democrat uh, presidents. And right now, the current balance is that you've got two of the liberal justices that are kind of the more like old school Democrat kind of strategic in um, trying to reach the like moderate Republicans and reach out to them and say, hey, um, I think that you should rule our way and like present the arguments, you know, things like that. But on the of the three justices, you've got Sonia Sotomayor, who's a little more um, I read this one author from National Review. And he said that um, Sonia Sotomayor is more like a bomb throwing liberal, basically, oh my um, gosh. where wow. she's she's more interested in the principle, in the result and not in how they get there and what the Constitution says. So uh, if Katanji Brown Jackson is going to be more like Sonia Sotomayor, where it's results oriented, not really trying to like persuade Justice Roberts and the other uh, Republican judges that are in the middle. That means that there's going to be more distance between the liberal wing of the court and the conservative wing of the court. And because She's make herself an outlier. Yes, exactly. So now you've got um, you're not changing the makeup of the court entirely. Like you still have six Republican nominated justices and three Democrat nominated justices. The Democrat Ketanji Brown Jackson is not is replacing another Democrat liberal judge. But you're going to have a change in the makeup of the left side of the court here of two people who are more strategic and pragmatic, uh, Stephen Breyer and Elena Kagan, kind of like, you know, trying to compromise with this moderate Republican judges and changing that left wing of the court to now be two of the more uh, activist judges and only one strategic judge left on the left wing. So we so. feel like this is going to create a bigger rift between kind of the swing votes. Yes. In the court and the left leaning side of the court. So how do we think this is going to play out with some major pro-life things bullet training their way? Yeah. 
well, to the Supreme Court. I mean, first, a question to ask is what are the abortion industry, what are the abortion organizations saying about her uh, nomination? They like her. Oh, yeah. They're excited. Oh, yeah. And I'm not completely sure why. Maybe just that she's proven herself to be really liberal. Mm -hmm. uh, so they assume that she'll be an abortion activist judge. Mm -hmm. uh, so that doesn't bode well for us. But I find it interesting that uh, Biden does not seem to be following the advice to become more moderate. Like he just picked probably one of the most leftist judges that we know of. And that's if you're saying this is going to backfire for him and for Democrats. I mean, I'm I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it means that we will probably event it will lead to the pendulum will swing the other way because people will be fed up with this extreme leftism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm I'm surprised he's shooting himself in the foot by right. picking such a leftist judge. You know, it's not surprising looking at the entirety of the administration of <laughs> things often backfiring. But uh, for this court judge, it's all about the political posturing of putting up somebody who's really woke to pander to the woke side of um, his base. But there, like what your question was, Brent, a second ago about what cases is this going to affect? None of the abortion cases that are before the Supreme Court right now are going to be affected by this nomination. Uh, Justice Stephen Breyer is not stepping down until the end of this term. And which when means, is that again? Yeah. Uh, it'll be in, in the, the summer. summer. In yeah. the summer. So we'll have a ruling on on Roe before uh, we get a new Supreme Court justice. Absolutely. The Mississippi case that's before the Supreme Court right now, and we'll talk about it more as this podcast goes on. Uh, the Mississippi case is um, before the Supreme Court. That's going to be ruled on before uh, Katanji Brown Jackson takes uh, the stand, takes the bench. Um, and then all of the uh, Texas Heartbeat Act cases that are active right now, uh, they're not before the Supreme Court. They could go back to the Supreme Court if we were right. really crazy, but it, <laughs> we're not on that trajectory right now. So it, there aren't any active abortion cases right now, front and center, that she would rule on. But, you know, this fight is going to go on. Even if Roe is overturned this summer, there's still going to be life issues that go before the Supreme Court uh, that we're going to have to discuss. And right. so she could affect that. But overall, I think that this nomination is going to backfire if she ends up being super woke like um, all of the woke groups are kind of praising her for right now uh, then that's going to end up alienating the Republican justices where normally you could have like a um, closer ruling maybe a 5-4 instead of a 6-3 or a 7-2 um, they're going to lose that persuasive power over the other justices. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that brings us to a great uh, segue to our next our next topic, and that's yes. what's going on with the Texas Heartbeat Act. The Heartbeat Act. So the Heartbeat Act turns six months old today. So that's a whole bunch of babies that are now seven and a half months. Oh, my gosh. And that's rapidly me the approaching. Feels. Right? Because uh, uh, your cardiac cells are fluttering. <laughs> uh, electrical pulses. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... The Supreme Court of Texas heard Whole Woman's Health versus Jackson, which is the federal case against the Heartbeat Act, right? And that was a couple of days ago. It, what happened there? Yeah, so it's it's uh, a portion of the federal case. Uh, it's the only last remaining strand sliver of the federal case that is, is uh, still going through the court system. So what the Texas Supreme Court, there's a, there's, there's a, a slight disagreement. It, a, it, not a genuine disagreement, as we'll point out. Um, but there's a slight disagreement as to whether the, the Heartbeat Act, whether what we call state agencies, so the Texas Medical Board, the Texas Nursing Association, um, whether uh, uh, whether they have any enforcement power over violations of the Texas Heartbeat Act. So whether there can, um, if a, an abortionist performs an abortion in violation of the Heartbeat. Um, law, then could they be subject to some sort of licensing ramification? Same thing with nurses, other medical providers. And so the the, the question that the Fifth Circuit did a, a, a thing that's called certifying. It means um, telling telling folks, uh, telling the, the parties, this is actually a question that deals with state law and state interpretation. So we as the federal court, um, it's not really, we're not in the best position to do that. We need your state elected state judges to decide that. So we're going to kind of take off this piece of it and send this question over to the Texas Supreme Court 
um, that we need answered by your elected judges okay. before we can finish dealing with your case. So that's what they did with these licensing officials. Um, and, you know, the te- state of Texas, the pro-life community, all of the legislators who passed this law, um, they intend, and it's pretty clear, intend in the Heartbeat Act that no government uh, actor has any enforcement authority over the Heartbeat Act. So essentially the state of Texas came on to the oral arguments last week and and said, hey, you know, Texas Supreme Court, like the other side, the, the abortion plaintiffs, they they are complaining that the government doesn't have, that the government has this enforcement authority. They don't want the government to have the enforcement authority. We agree. We don't want to have anything to do with it, you know? Exactly. Right? So the state of Texas is urging, was urging um, the Texas Supreme Court to, yeah, like we please say that they have no authority, um, uh, an interpretation of this, this is we have no, we have no authority over enforcing the heartbeat act. Um, and that would ostensibly give uh, the abortion industry what they want. No one to, no criminal uh, enforcement, no enforcement um, at the government level. You but they're still this. really mad. No. They're still so mad. Why are they, they don't want that. No, wait, yeah, wait, wait. But the law, right. if I remember right, now I'm no legal expert lobbyist guy. That's people down the hall and you. The law as written says the state doesn't enforce this thing, correct? Correct. So they're getting their argument from there are provision. It references the act references um, another provision of Texas code. Okay, okay. where those state agencies, you know, historically through our abortion laws, the medical board, the nursing board, they have authority to deal with licensing procedures. So it's really like, okay, well, over here, they still have authority and that impacts the the Texas Heartbeat Act. Um, it, it's it's very, like I said, it's a sliver of an argument. Um, it, it, it does not seem to um, hold any water. And, but what's crucial here is that the abortion industry admits they don't want to take the state's offer of agreeing that there's no enforcement activity here because they, if they do, they lose their ability to contest the law as a whole to be at all. This and that's is what they law. want. They're trying to kick out the Harvey law. Right. They're trying to get abortion back in Texas. Right. They don't care if the Texas Medical Board or the nursing nurses can have licensing trouble. They, they don't really care about that. It's their last little pigeonhole into. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just like if you say, hey, you stole something from me, Emily. And I say, well, Kim, I'll give it back to you. And you're like, well, no, I don't want it back. <laughs> what are we doing? I want to sue you. I don't want it it's back. I want to exact- sue you so I can get it back. Well, I can give it back. No, 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 no. I need to sue you so I can get it back. Exactly. Exactly. Sounds like my toddlers when they fall. <laughs> <laughs> you no. Know? You're not wrong. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Yeah. That's crazy. But also, like, it just blows my mind because they're just that catch-22 situation that they're in of, like, they're claiming that they're being, like, oppressed by the state and we have to have relief from the state right now. Uh, And the state says, okay, well, I mean, you can have your relief. It doesn't. Exactly. It's fine. Um, But also the fact, like, how how much of a failure this lawsuit is. Like, remember when they started this? They filed this lawsuit back in... Uh, July, I think, of last year, July 2021, and they tried, tried to sue literally every yeah, American. They just in the tried United to sue States. everybody, anybody yeah. who like hmm, you can be sued, you can be sued, like anybody. Let's just sue everybody. It'll be fine. Some of us um, are named in some of those things. Yeah, some yeah. of us. Big fun. Yep, yep. Uh, hashtag John Sego. Um, <laughs> anyways, He's been sued 14 times. Yeah, our, our poor guy. Tune in next week. (laughs) Yeah, you'll know about all the tea. Yes, for sure. Um, Anyway, so they started this lawsuit in July 2021, trying to sue like anybody that they possibly could, and the Supreme Court rejected that. This lawsuit had gone to the Supreme Court twice, the Supreme Court of the U.S., not just the Supreme Court of Texas, twice, and they said, "No, no, you." can't do that like they tried to sue this whole swath of individuals and they said okay no we're going to let this lawsuit continue just with the state agencies but that's the abortion industry's weakest argument right now because the state agencies have no authority to enforce this law right and the law wasn't even written to to ask state agencies to try to enforce the law the whole the whole harvey law was written with the intent of empowering regular citizens like you and me to enforce the law 
and report a crime when we see or hear about one. Absolutely. And it's just ridiculous that they're 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 asking for something that doesn't even exist. Well, okay, I'm being so so the Supreme Court of Texas has heard this, mm -hmm. and now we're waiting on an opinion. Correct. Best case scenario is in worst case. So best case scenario is that the Texas Supreme Court rules that, uh, yeah, the state agencies have no enforcement authority under this. And so then the case will go, they'll answer that question. It'll be an easy decision at the Fifth Circuit level and the case will be dismissed. So that's best, best case scenario. And worst case? Uh, worst case scenario is that they do anything short of that. Because okay. then the Fifth Circuit is going to have to kind of source some of that out. Yeah. How okay. are you feeling uh, about the outcome after hearing the oral arguments last week? I'm very confident. Sweet. You know, I was talking to people at church this weekend and they said, you know, we hear about the we heard about the Texas Heartbeat Act so much whenever it first took effect. And now, you know, I'm not hearing about it as much. Why is that? Well, I mean, there's a lot of things going on in our world and there um, a lot of other things are taking the sky didn't fall in like, they, right. you know, we, we don't have there's not women dying in the streets like they yeah. said that there was going to be told our economy was going to crash Correct. did it not Correct. Okay. And so we're seeing Not for that reason. Oh, yeah. burn. <laughs> well, also the the new abortion drugs, well they're not really that new, but they're they're, they're touting them in a new way. Mm -hmm. They're they're trying to probably use that as a replacement. Well, I mean the real, the reality abortions. is we're seeing that uh, that uh, may I think kind of the mainstream America is seeing that we don't need abortion. Mhm. Mm like that's not our society. The success of women does not depend on whether we have the availability and means to kill our unborn children. That's so true. Can I tell a quick story? Sure, go ahead. That just remind that reminded me of this uh, woman who called the other day uh, with as she works at a pregnancy center, and we were talking about some kind of event that we're having, working on that. And she said, "Can I tell you a story?" So it's really her story. She said, "This woman called us the other day, and she said that she had chosen life. She's about three months pregnant." And the only reason she chose life is because abortion was illegal in Texas and she didn't have as much instinct to go try to find it elsewhere. And she's like, oh, well, it's illegal. I'll just make it work. And then a few months mm -hmm. went by and she started to bond with her child and start to to realize, like, I, I never should have wanted this in the first place. I can't believe I thought about it. I'm so happy I'm pregnant. My baby's alive. And it's because of this pro-life law. So she, it was just beautiful to hear that. And that's exactly that's what we amazing. want. We want women to be able to say, during their time of crisis and stress and not realizing maybe what resources they have right away, just take a moment and breathe and find those resources. And we will help you bring bring those resources to you. And that's just beautiful. Now it she is. has a beautiful, happy, healthy pregnancy. That is, that's, that's very beautiful. And we're up to what? Potentially 18,000 of these yeah. stories now? Great. 100, 100 a day. babies a day for the past six months. A day, so right about 18,000. That's, that's like a stadium full of kids. Oh, wow. That's a stadium Giga full Maggie's. of kids. Oh, okay. All the future Aggies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On the happy note, we have a little business to take care of. So we're going to take a break real quick and do that. Texas Right to Life is facing 14 lawsuits from Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry. They're suing us because we helped pass the Texas Heartbeat Act, and they're trying to scare us pro-lifers into backing down. Please join us in the fight against Planned Parenthood and donate to protect the Texas Heartbeat Act. You can fight for the unborn and build a pro-life Texas that values every human life. Go to texasrighttolife.com slash lawsuit to make your contribution. Every cent will help and it's greatly appreciated. Have a child in high school? Register them for Team Life Camp coming up on April 1st weekend in Carville, Texas. They're gonna have a blast with canoeing, archery, hiking, and much more. And all the while learning how to better defend the unborn from the crazy agenda of the left. But hurry, the ticket price increases on March 19th, so grab your tickets now. Every life is sacred and every life is worthy of protection. Register now at teamlifecamp.com. Welcome back to the Pro-Life Podcast. And in other news, Columbia just legalized abortion. Up to 24 weeks. Up to yep. 24 With weeks. With a few exceptions. Well, so the Constitutional Court ruled 5-4 last Monday. Well, not yesterday, Monday. Monday previously. Um to allow abortion up to 24 weeks. Yeah. You know, it, it, it 
hurt. I mean, it, it, it's heartbreaking because we're seeing this trend in Latin American countries that are doing what the developed, con- you know, doing what America and Russia did 30, 40 years ago. And like, can't they see? Yeah. Russia this- was 100 years ago. I looked it up earlier. Russia was actually the first oh to legalize gosh. abortion in 1920. And uh, it, it's, it was briefly illegal. Uh, Stalin actually made it illegal. Not that he cares about babies. Uh, he was actually worried about their population decreasing because he was murdering everyone. And then it became legal again, and it's been legal ever since. And it's been cascading around the world. Mexico, um, people might remember September 7th, um, mm-hmm. this past year in 2021. Wow, time flies. Uh, legalized abortion. And on that same day, there was this uh, an earthquake. Oh, it was yeah. a seven-point scale earthquake. And I, when I woke up to both of those things as headlines in the news, I was just like, yeah, yeah, that's God. That's God speaking to us right now, mm-hmm. saying, don't do this. Yeah, I feel like uh, this conversation starter has really sucked the air out of the room. Oh, um, man, sorry. It's heavy. It no, really it's heavy. heavy. Even it So is. even their president uh, condemned the ruling, uh, saying that he's worried that abortion, which goes against life, will become a regular practice. And he went on to talk about how he is concerned that it will become basically just contraception in the right. country. Birth control, um, abortion. I mean, he's, he's not wrong. I mean, that's what that's yeah, what's happened every place, every country that's legalized abortion. Yeah. So we're 40, 50 years down the road from this here now. We don't really need a crystal ball to know that this is where this is going. Yeah. yeah. This is where it ends. Is just, yeah, it just becomes I mean, normal. Russia all over again. Russia's in the news a lot lately. But just mm-hmm. thinking about just the topic of abortion in Russia. The uh, average woman has eight abortions so in Russia, and they use abortion literally as a birth control method. Eight? And yeah, it's it's shocking. It, it's mind blowing. Um, but it makes sense, being that they were the first country ever to legalize abortion. It's such a deeply embedded part of their culture now that it's normal, and it's just heartbreaking. And um, pray for Russia. Pray for mm-hmm. Ukraine. Um, everybody needs our prayer right now. Mm-hmm. I think, too, you just see like with Colombia legalizing abortion, how there's just that domino effect. Like within the last few years, all of these uh, Latin American countries that for a long time were culturally pro-life for a long, long time and how we can't get too comfortable in that, how um, it always has to be a priority of the pro-life movement to make sure that we uh, keep fighting these culture wars and keep uh, affirming the sanctity of life to other people in our society, to our churches, our communities, everybody, because that we're only, um, you know, a snap away from this just coming back and becoming normal and becoming accepted. So you saw um, Argentina legalize abortion, Mexico legalize abortion, now Colombia legalizes mm-hmm. abortion. And, you know, I don't think those are all just isolated incidents. They feed into each yeah, other. they're copying and, each other. Yeah. And following uh other countries like the United States and others that um, have had legalized abortion for a long time. Uh, so I think there's also a degree of hope there that if the United States will overturn Roe, that hopefully we can be that domino that causes the others to fall and turning back around to uh, protect preborn children. Yeah. Kim, you're so right. So that goes to not being complacent. I mean, we with, it, with the upcoming Mississippi Dobbs case, the 15 week ban, that's currently pending in front of the United States Supreme Court that could potentially overturn Roe v. Wade. We're hearing from a lot of um, uh, in folks in the pro-life community that think, okay, once SCOTUS, uh, once the United States Supreme Court overturns Roe, that it's done, that right. we're done. We can but go like, focus on other aren't issues. Aren't you happy? Aren't you glad your work's almost over? And That's not right. Your work is just beginning. <laughs> You're exactly yeah. right. In a whole new way. You're exactly right. I mean, what the law is is a more it is important because it's a it's a moral arbiter of what is acceptable and you know typically just like the story you were you were talking about. If it's illegal, you you, you hesitate to do it, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's saving in, in, in that aspect, um, but that doesn't mean it goes away, right? right? It's illegal to to drink and drive, okay? But well, and you and you think twice about it before doing it, mm-hmm. but it still happens and it still kills people. It's, that's exactly where we're going to be. Yeah. There will still be illegal abortions that we have to fight against. Uh, there will still be uh, judicial activists and other uh, lawmakers who are going to try to make abortion legal all over again. And then we can't forget the the biggest part of our work 
is likely going to be serving the women who are now maintaining their pregnancies and having children. Those women who were not going to have a child at first, they were not going to keep their baby. They need help. So we're going to be ramping up those services a lot. There's a lot of work to do. Yeah. And we need to model for other countries how to overturn abortion law because we're one of the first. Uh, there's been a few others, uh, but we're one of the biggest, the most vocal, and uh, in a way, it feels like the biggest first country to overturn abortion law. And we need to show other countries how to do it. So let's do it right. The yeah. First thing you find. There you go. <laughs> for sure. And yeah, I, sorry for such a depressing episode. Uh, it's okay. Well, yeah. It's a time. But you know what? We're coming up on uh, just a lot of big opportunities, I think, in the pro-life movement. We've got uh, the Mississippi case that could overturn Roe v. Wade. And then that makes the question of abortion go back to every state. So we have a big opportunity there in um, basically going state by state to protect pre-born yeah. children. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, Actually, we've already been helping with that. We've exactly. uh, our legislative team. This this is cool. Now I'm getting excited again. I'm not depressing. <laughs> okay. Our legislative team has been getting calls from multiple states to Texas saying, OK, we liked what you did. Show us how to do it. And it's so cool to see on our calendar, like, Ledge team's talking with Florida next week. Oh, they're talking with this other state next week. And I'm like, yeah, go, Ledge team, go. Exactly. So let's get the heart be law in every state it's gonna be great for sure that's what we're working towards and so i think that we have a lot of big opportunities and just all the chaos that's happening in the world too it's a reminder that we need to live good christ-centered lives because you never know whenever things are going to turn on a dime that all of this chaos in the world is a sign that we can't be too comfortable uh here that we, we have to rely on christ to be our strength to be our peace and Amen. yeah preach yeah uh lent is coming up tomorrow so that's a good time to you know get right with the lord basically um <laughs> prayer so, and fasting for sure um the 40 days for life campaigns too are coming yes. up so oh, yeah, yeah. get 40 involved days for with life that always starts its kickoff on ash wednesday and the 40 days are the 40 days of lent in case you didn't know that so uh, now is perfect time to go stand and pray outside of an abortion mill mm-hmm. and see for yourself the women and men going in and yeah. talk to them, help them, pray yeah. for them. It's still needed. I think that there's this misconception that with the Texas Heartbeat Act, you know, we have reduced abor- abortions dramatically and saved thousands of preborn children. Uh, but abortions aren't completely stopped in Texas, right. that we still have work to do. And so um, here in your community, it's not hard. Just go to the uh, abortion clinic that's nearest to you and stand outside there and pray. And it is a little scary at first. Like I was kind of scared the first time I went mm-hmm. uh, to an abortion clinic to pray. Um, but it's just one of the most powerful things that you could do. Yeah. You can take a buddy you can call up Texas Right to Life. We'll help train you we'll on your buddy. counseling. Yeah. We can hook you up with a local volunteer so that you don't have to go alone. Yeah. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's really, um, yeah, it's really eye-opening to stand there and um, have, be one-on-one or face-to-face to see the, these families going in and knowing what's, what they're going in for. And so it really uh, moves you from this complacent, uh, oh, yeah, this is wrong, it's terrible, I wish it wasn't so, to, okay, what do I do now? Mm-hmm. Well, where's my role yeah. in this? Yeah. And what am I supposed to say? Holy Spirit, what am I supposed to say right now to this woman who is seeking an abortion right now? That is a a prayer that I often say because I, as much as we've trained and practiced dialogue, sometimes it all goes out the window. Oh, I just hit myself. So excited. (laughs) It all goes out the window in that moment when you're nervous and you're talking to someone. It's literally a life or death situation. But um, 40 Days for Life and Texas Right to Life, so many other wonderful orgs can help. Um, But yeah, that all starts in a big way tomorrow. Ash Wednesday, Lent. What are you doing for Lent? I haven't seen it yet. I, yeah, the nerd of the group is going to try and turn off all his tech at about seven o'clock at night and just Mm -hmm. shut it all down in the house. Right, kids, no more video games. No more, like, my kids are going to freak out (laughs) um, that they're not going to get to play Minecraft Fortnite. Uh, Offer it up to the Lord. Yes. But (laughs) doggone it, we're going to spend some more family conversational time and uh, Bible discussion time and kind of refocus a little bit. That's great. Over the next uh, 40 days leading up to Easter. So I'm I'm uh, a little anxious about whether or not I can keep up with this because I live an extremely plugged in life. 
Do you? Uh, oh, oh, you are oh. our IT guy. I mean, so, I mean it's, it's a good thing. It's in a little to be ways. expected. So, uh, you know, if there's a work call, I'll, you know, that's mm. that's not the things I'm turning off. It's the uh, Instagram and Facebook oh, endless yeah. scrolling that right now with my Facebook feed full of uh, Ukrainian war. Oh, it's um, really hard. Yeah. I, I think it would probably help my anxiety a lot to not be skimming through that. Uh, you guys giving well, up anything else? I gave else? up all social media like four years ago, and it's the best thing I ever did. <laughs> so when I need to read the news, I have to actually Google it. Uh, so what like we're doing for days. lit, I know, like get a piece of paper and <laughs> read it. Days. So no, what we're going to do, my husband and I decide we're going to go keto for the first time ever for 40 days. And of course, not just for diet reasons. It's always, it's really great for diet reasons, but it is, it is a spiritually exhausting <laughs> activity and we're going to do it. And uh, we tried it once for like two weeks and we liked it, but uh, then we were like, this is hard. And like so no bread and stuff. Well, right? yeah, it's I super mean... low carbs and, but it's, but it's, it's actually really cool. It's really biblically based. If you think about it, like any sort of fasting is, but this uh, it's modern day, you know, um, healthy fasting and um, I'm excited about it because I know it's going to be hard and that's what makes it a sacrifice. Right. And uh, and it would be nice to be healthy and not be tired all the time because we have a we have a difficult job and I need a little more energy. So yeah, <laughs> I can help that. with that. <laughs> that's kind of similar to what I'm giving up. So for Lent, I'm going to uh, give up. Uh, well, I don't. I'm going to go to bed earlier and wake up earlier. That's um, the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> exactly. Um, and honestly, like this morning, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. But last night, um, I was going to start like today, actually get a jump on it. Uh, my cousin called me at, I think, 10 o'clock last night asking for help for it with an essay, his first college essay mm. ever. Oh. I ended up staying up till like 2.30 in the morning. Oh, so okay. tomorrow is a new day. <laughs> uh, we're going to see how that goes. Hopefully these calls do not happen throughout Lent because oh, then God. that's going to make this really <laughs> a sacrifice. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I'm planning to do. Make sure I'm getting the most out of my day there, um, spending the mornings in prayers like throughout the day. Um, and awesome. then getting home at a decent hour too before the sun goes down, like that's kind of an important thing. So that's my goal. Awesome. Um, it's a good time to get right with the Lord. And uh, Texas Right to Life is a Christian organization. And so we uh, offer up, um, lift up our supporters in prayer every single day. So if you have prayer intentions, make sure you comment those below. Um, or you can email us, tag us on social media, and we'll make sure that we're lifting you up in prayer too because we're all um, just this Christian family and trying yeah. to uh, fight for this cause and we can't yeah. do it alone. Yeah, there's no way to do this alone. We have to pray and fast and we understand that Christ is our leader in all this. We, we're not just doing it of our own power. Like it, He has saved us and we're just here to be His hands and feet. Yeah. Preach. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, <laughs> Uh, I think that kind of wraps it up for the day. So. Uh, so. But I would be derelict in my civic duties if I did not remind you that today is election day. And if you have not voted yet, you need to go vote. I'm looking at you. Go vote. Uh, you can get our pro-life voter guide on TexasRightToLifePAC.com. P-A-C.com. Uh, and look up there in the top right corner. There's a little button that'll tell you. It's probably kind of a big button yeah, right now button. that tells you where to get that voter guide. You can go ahead and download that sucker and go vote. All right. Also, tomorrow, Texas Independence Day. Mm. Happy birthday, Texas. Happy birthday, Texas. Happy birthday, Sam Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, is that it? Yeah. That's that was it. That? That's wow. A big day we have tomorrow. covered a lot of things. Next week... John Segoe, Dr. John Segoe, the man, the myth, the legend, will join us <laughs> to discuss brain death and hate mail. He doesn't know what it says yet. Oh, yeah. We've seen it. He hasn't, but it's directed at him. This will be fun. The hate See mail you next is not from us. <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> no, we did not write it. It <laughs> came from outside. Okay. We got hate mail. We're going to read it Bum, to him. Threads, you name it. All yep. It. All those things. This podcast is made possible by your donations. We are so very thankful for all of your sacrificial giving to make this happen. If you would like to make a donation to support our podcast, go to TexasRightToLife.com slash donate. 
Thank you for joining the Pro Life Podcast, and we'll see you next week.